Why don't you read one through six? Okay. No, her. Oh. And then you read uh, actually just seven, seven through twenty-one. Okay. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not either enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by the, another way, that man is a thief and robber. But who entered? But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice. He calls his and he, and he calls his own sheep by name and lets and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them and chef and the sheep follow him. For they know his voice, a stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him. For they do not know the voices of strangers. This figure of shepherd's speech Jesus used with <coughs> used, used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, truly she stopped Yeah, she stopped there. Sorry. <laughs> So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is hired hand and not a shepherd who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also. They will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. There was again a division among the Jews because of these words. Many of them said, He has a demon, and he is insane. Why listen to him? Others said, These are not the words of the one who is oppressed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Um, so Jesus uses, actually is obviously mixing metaphors here, right? He, he says that he's three things in this passage. What are the three things that he says he is? He's the door. He's the good shepherd. And what? That's well, the door, a door or gate. It's one more. He doesn't explicitly say it, but he, he implies it. It's actually the first thing he, in the first metaphor he gives. Nope. That, that's part of the door. No, he's not the gatekeeper. Who, who is the gatekeeper in this analogy, by the way? In the, in the first one. Who? Who? Well, who do you think the gatekeeper would be? Yeah, it would be, it would be God the Father. And God the Father opens up for him because what? Who is he? 
Yeah, he's so... What's kind of uh, confusing is is that he later says he's the good shepherd, but that's in relation to something else. He's the rightful shepherd of the sheep. As opposed to who? False shepherds. Yeah, false shepherds who are called thieves and robbers. So he is the rightful shepherd. They're actually his sheep. And do you guys get the imagery here? If you guys Do you guys know anything about shepherds, how they kind of call their sheep this is like straight out of literally what happens with the shepherd because the sheep know his voice when he goes up to the pen and he calls to them they start lining up and they come forward to him but if it's somebody else they get freaked out and they rush to the back of the pen they run away and that's the imagery he's using he's saying look my sheep hear my voice uh they'll line they the shepherd calls them they line up before him, and he goes, and they follow him. That's the imagery he wants to give us. Now, um, this connects to what we were talking about before in terms of Christ's true sheep recognize his word, his teaching, right? And here he says, look, the, the, the voice of a stranger, they won't recognize. They don't actually follow them. So who do you think he's talking about primarily as we, again, who's John writing against? Gnostics. Gnostics. But uh, Brett and I were talking as well. He opens it up a little bit more, though, because it's not just Gnostics. He makes the statement that everyone who came before me was a thief and a robber. Can you think of some, maybe some of the religions that came before Christ? Well, even, Brian, even this right here, though, uh, uh, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, right. that climbs in another way, right. that man is a thief and a robber. So that's kind of like more of that, right? Right, and who, who's opening the door? So what is he saying about all other religions? Buddha is wrong. There, well, he's saying something stronger than that. The door is closed because why? Because who's opening the door? And so all those other religions are not of God. Um, God did not let any of those other religions to his sheep. All those other religions are false. So in our day of like, well, maybe other religions are true, or maybe there's a core truth to all religions, and they're all just coming out in mythology and all that sort of thing, that's rejected by Christ right here. He's saying, actually, all those other religions are false. Everyone who came before me was a thief and a robber. Now, um, he then gives the imagery of being the good shepherd, right? So what is the difference here between a good shepherd and a hireling that he mentions? What is it? Sorry, there's like a million different... What? They flee with the word of the car. They flee. Well, they flee when they see the wolf coming, right? So they're not protectors of the sheep. Why are they not protectors of the sheep? Because they don't love them. And when the wolf comes, they're in danger, right? They're not with the sheep to sacrifice anything. They want the sheep to sacrifice for them. That's why they're thieves and robbers. That's why the mixed metaphor kind of comes together in terms of, look, Anyone of a different religion, any other Christ, any other cult, even if it's Christian, any pastor who's a false pastor is not going to be for the sheep. He's not going to be sacrificing for the sheep. He is looking to get from the sheep, and that's why he's not going to protect them from wolves. Because guess what? The shepherd who protects you from wolves is a jerk, and nobody wants to be a part of his flock. They want to go down the street to Mr. Rogers, who's not going to say anything bad about anybody. And the, the fake shepherd knows that. So he wants to tickle the ears. So you, he, you can't be an ear tickler and a destroyer of wolves at the same time. Like, if you're going to be a violent destroyer of a wolf, then you're going to offend a lot of people. So they're going to go somewhere else. So a false shepherd, a hireling, is not going to defend people, not going to defend the sheep from the wolves at all. Um, it, now, he's a thief and a robber in what way, then? 
What's that? Instead of giving life, he's killing them. Yeah, he's taking. Yeah. He's not giving, he's taking. Notice the contrast with Christ is, but I have come to give them life and to give it to them abundantly. Now, that verse is taken out of context more than probably, you know, most of the Bible. So, what, what does that mean, to give life abundantly? Jets, Ferraris, <laughs> all the women you want, houses. houses. No, what, what is, in context, what is it really just saying? Ab abundantly means, like, uh, to the utmost. And what, what is the utmost life in the book of John? Eternal life. So to give it to them life and give it to them abundantly means I've come to give them eternal life. It doesn't mean I've come to make them rich, healthy, strong, uh, the best people in the world, uh, the most honored in the world, none of that. That's not what it means. So that's what Christ has come. So that's why he lays his life down for the sheep. He sacrifices for them because he loves them, he protects them, and he even gives his own life for them, as opposed to all these false teachers. In other religions and even in other Christianities, which is what he's talking about here in, uh, in Gnosticism. So how are ways that cult leaders, which is what I would describe as these false teachers, they're just leaders of cults, um, how do they take away then? How do they take away life? In what in what ways? Well, first and foremost, yeah, false gospels. Um, that's one of the ways they can take away life, and that usually is false religion, whatever. They take away your eternal life. Uh, they block you hearing from from hearing the truth by giving you a bunch of falsehood. So they are absolute murderers in that way. What about like the widows being stripped of their homes and things like that? They take away your money. They take away your money to your detriment. I cannot tell you how many times I have heard health and wealth preachers say, I don't care, you need to have faith. I don't care if you can't pay your rent. You have faith in God and you send that rent check into me for $1,000 and God will bless you based on that. They're just looking to take, for, take life from you. Uh, you never have a, a real preacher of God say, yeah, don't pay for your house or your bills and care for your family. Uh, strip them of everything they need and give it to me. That's not something that you're going to hear. But you will hear it from a cult leader. Sell your house and give me the money. Uh, sell your possessions. We'll just live in a big commune. You'll live on the floor. I'll have a, like a really nice room with a really good bed. But that's only because, you know, I represent Jesus. And you have to kind of do that. I mean, you, you wouldn't want Jesus to sleep on the floor, would you? I think just like really obviously all of the competing religions whose uh, priests climb in another way they're actually after the sheep for literal death yes like all of the other pagan religions demand human sacrifice yeah literally. they demand that you kill your children right your gods that is how they feed and, and so archetypally it's they're looking for sheep to sacrifice yeah that, that's the very imagery right why does a thief go in because he's hungry and he wants to kill a sheep right and eat it but the shepherd is like, hey, no, I, I've actually come because I, I want to preserve your life, and I'm going to give you life, and you can go in and out and pasture, and I'm going to actually you know, give you good life or whatever. Yeah. I'm not looking to eat you. Which really flips the metaphor of sheep on its head, because yeah. sheep throughout all of history have been there to kill, to eat, to right. sacrifice. And here the shepherd is saying, yeah. I'm going to be slaughtered for you, so you won't have to be slaughtered. And that's why he's the good shepherd versus all the wicked. Um, what's another way that, uh, that these leaders steal life from people? So you got the soul already and then money, right? So they teach false doctrine leads them to their death. Yep. They also have money, possessions, things like that. But I mean, how about they still, how about they steal your personhood from you? Um, you are you are to be assumed into the collective. It's like the Borg, right? Um, sorry for all of you who are not Star Trek fans and don't get it. But uh, you're, you're being assumed into the collective, so you are not allowed to have... Godliness in their minds is basically you are stripped of your actual personality. Um, you are stripped of who you are as an individual. You are just kind of like part of this larger glob, like this worker drone... So they'll often put their people to work, even to the point of just leading to death. They don't care about them because you're just a worker drone. That's it. 
um, your humanity is stolen from you in these a lot of these religions and cults uh, in order to become holy. As though holiness means that you become something, something like uh, you know, like like you speak overly pious when you're holy or something. And it's like, why why would you speak? you know, in, in these spiritual terms now or something, and you wouldn't just use the language you used before. It's that sort of thing. Some cults even will do like, you know, thou, thine, sister, sister Mary, and sister, you know, whatever. It's like, okay, well, did you normally speak that way? Like, why are you speaking that way now? Yeah. Um, I was thinking about how um, <coughs> they instill fear. There's no assurance of salvation through the blood of Christ, right. and they instill fear, and so it's like, the works righteousness. I got to do this. I got to do that. I got to do this in order to get there. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, yeah, that's good. So why do they do that? Why do they instill fear? Because they can, um, what do they, what do they get? Yes. They get Power, it. right? Yes. And they can tell you how right. to do it. So you are a means for them to feel powerful, yeah. to have power. And so, in other words, you're being used in every way. You're being used for that, to have power. There's one more that I, when I hear, especially when it's a man, that I'm always waiting for. When I hear there's some, like, group that broke off and they went into the woods or there's some guy who thinks he's the way, like, I'm waiting for it. I'm just like, okay, let me hear it. I'm about to hear it. What is it? Jesse, you know what it is? Take all the women. Yep, all the women. They're all mine now. Well, because God wants me to have all of them. So... And you wouldn't want something different than God. There is a cult in Utah where the father uh, claims to be the second coming of Christ, that he's Christ again incarnate. I don't know why uh, there needs to be a second one, but um, he's got this really little cult around, mainly his family and then some other people. And he convinced this cult that he needed to have all their wives, including the wife of his son. And they believed it. And they gave him their wives and all that. Um, I'm just waiting for it. David Koresh, you guys familiar with him? That's exactly what he said. Oh, I need all the women now. Um, you know, or it's, it's, it's something distorted. Like, so Joseph, Joseph Smith, right, there were, there were enough women to go around, but it, it needed to be that, well, God told me that polygamy is a thing now, so I, I get to marry all these young women that I really like or whatever. Um, I, I read a, a diary, actually, of Emma Smith, who was his wife, his actual wife. Um, and she actually caught him in the barn with a young girl, and, and then he suddenly had this epiphany, this revelation that he was supposed to have more than one woman. Uh, Mohammed, same thing. Yeah. I was about to talk about the same Mohammed. Yeah. Thing Mohammed, same thing. It, it, it is just like it's par for the course. I'm just waiting for it. It's, it's every cult I've ever seen where a man is the head. Now, when a woman is the head of the cult, what's fascinating um, is that it's a celibacy for everybody. <laughs> it's like, huh, this almost seems like they're just human preferences. Um, usually they're older women, and so it's celibacy for, for everybody across the board. So if you're familiar with the Shakers, and by the way, the Shakers today, I think there may be one left or they died off, I forget, because of celibacy. <laughs> It's like, way to go. It just shows you the devil's religion is anti-creational in its sexuality. And so eventually it kills itself. It destroys itself. The sheep are destroyed by it. You don't live on in, on the earth. You're all destroyed because it's murder rather than life. That's happening in pagan society right now. Oh, absolutely. Yep. Everything's turned up to the yep. pyramid. Being the judgment of God. Right yeah, yeah, judgment of God right now. Yes. Brian, if you want to follow Marx, you're going you're gonna to go that way. I didn't read it because I've heard I've heard environmentalists say that all a lot. Yeah, but that's it. It's it, they're religions of death. Um, and again, the contrast is Christ saying, "I don't need, and I'm God. I don't need anything from you. I'm going to give my life for you. And if I tell you to give up things, it's because they're idols in your life that are destroying you. They're murdering you. So I'm saying, hey." You may want to sacrifice your money to God because if you treat it as an idol, it's going to ruin you. You may want to give your sexuality over to God because right now it's actually leading to death of you and your family. 
Like, you might want to actually give power over to God because ultimately you having power is destroying yourself. But that's very different than a cult leader being like, yeah, you know, you need to give all this stuff to me so I have it. Uh, that's not what Christ does. Christ actually is the good shepherd, and he's come to give his life for us, not take it away from us. So he wants you to be an individual with your own personalities. Obviously, he wants you to be godly. He doesn't want you to be th do you know keep doing the things you were doing when you were wicked. But um, but he wants you to have your personalities. Holiness has nothing to do with you being like some sort of like monotone weird starry eyed have you ever seen people in a cult to where they're like they have this like glare it's like why don't you join us and it's this weird it is really weird have you ever talked to like mormon missionaries or anything they've got like that glare it's like hey guys snap out of it. um but no you you can become that person and you should have what what does the bible say is it a cult no let every man have his own wife and every woman have her own husband, and they're yours. You have them, no one else. Paul isn't like, oh, yeah, give them to me. But Paul's like, no, I'm not even going to have my own, but you guys have your own for your benefit. Um, you guys have your own money. It, does God require you? No, you have to have 90% of your money given to the church. No. Each man, according to what you have been blessed, you decide, you work it out with God and what you're going to give to the ministry, to the poor. You do that. Does God command you to do that? Yes, you're to do that. But the, the, the actual amount, you decide that. Cheerful uh, giver. Yeah, cheerful giver. You're, no one's demanding that you give to them, and it's not to one person so that you become high and mighty. Even for us elders, we're to have double honor. I try to make this point every time we talk about double honor. We're to have double honor. That's not just so that, oh, well, we get like double. It's also that that's capped at double so that you don't actually, oh, well, I'm going to make a million dollars from the church this year. It's like, uh, no, that's not, that's far more than double honor. You're not allowed to do that. Um, it should be capped at that so that elders are not becoming rich off of the congregation. And so everything in Christianity screams uh, Christ's sacrifice for you not cult so if you guys get people who are like oh well christianity is just another cult it's like no it's not let me show you the difference this is where you should go this is the difference christ giving his life versus the cult demanding you give your life to them totally different they put you in seclusion too where christianity sends you out right so they, they, they yeah, they cut everybody off, right? Uh, it's like yeah. you, you come to our commune and we just live here and you don't go out unless it's to get groceries yeah. or whatever. And whereas Christianity is like, go into the world, go talk to your workers, go talk to your family, go call people to repentance. It's just completely different. Along those lines, um, in uh, verse uh, 9, I am the door. Uh, if anyone enters by me, he will be saved and go in and out and find pasture. Yeah. Can you explain the metaphor there? Because it seems like, is, what's the in and out? I mean, is it going out into the world, back to the church? Is, it, is, is the people of God the sheepfold or the pastor? Or is it, it seems, it's just I don't like, know. I don't know if I would stretch the metaphor to try to figure out what the pen is versus the pasture or whatever. I think the point is, is that um, he's not come to slaughter them. He's come to actually allow them to feed and also give them the shelter of the pen. Um, and so the idea is that they'll have both shelter and uh, what they need for food. He's not coming to destroy them as the thief and the robber are, or the hireling, the hireling that leaves them to the wolf or whatever. So along those same, same lines, just to, to be sure, so one of the ways that they take life from you, these thieves and robbers, is false gospel. However, I do want to warn you, it can be that they have a real gospel, but they have all those other characteristics. So just be careful because... The, the actual Church of Christ should have none of those characteristics. It shouldn't be like, oh, well, you know, they only have four out of five. It's like, no, no, no. They should have none of them. Um, if they have any of them, you should run from that. Um, because that's not really a Christian church then. You're looking at a cult. So I, I give that to you to say, instead of actually having to learn 25 million doctrines of all these different religions... 
and cults, you can actually look at every single one of them, and I do mean every single one. And they will have at least one of these characteristics, if not more of them. And that's true of cults, world religions, whatever it may be. They'll have these. They will work toward anti-life in your life rather than giving you life. Every single one, except for Christianity, that's actually the true religion of God. Well, and you can see that in the uh, chapter before that on how the Pharisees dealt with the parents of the blind man and right. the blind man. They did exactly those yep. things. Yeah. And what did he call them? You guys are you guys are liars and murderers. Yeah, because they're the ones he's addressing. Yeah. In this scripture. Most of the cults too are antinomian. Yeah. Adultery. Yeah. I mean, just goes down. Well, so they're antinomian to a certain degree. Like for like I'll, I'll think like the the Manichees that Augustine was a part of, right? So uh, have lots of sex. No one get married, and no one impregnate anyone. Um, and uh, it's around the leader uh, of, uh, what's his name? They're called the Manichees. What's his name? M Mani. Um, so they're around the leader, Mani. Um, so he has power, and you listen to his every word. He gets that sort of like, oh, yeah, I'm the guru. Everybody listens to me or whatever. And yet he's taking away your children from you by telling you have lots of sex with one another, but don't get married and don't have children. <laughs> So, and, and that's typical among the Gnostics as well, in general. He, he was a Gnostic cult. <coughs> that, Doug Wilson likes to say that all the freedoms that pagan religion gives you are freedoms that can be exercised in a 5 by 9 jail cell. <laughs> yeah. um, which is the same thing for the pagan religion, where the things that they count, that you can have this and that, and you can have drugs. Um, they can all be done within a, a jail cell. Right? And, it, and it'll, it'll give up everything to gain these little... You know, scraps yeah. of nothing. Well, and ev everything that you're allowed to do is really for the cult. So if you're allowed to go make money, it's so that you give to the cult. If you're allowed to have children, it's because they want you to sacrifice your children to the cult. Um, either literally in these religions where you sacrifice your children, or like in Islam, they become more soldiers. Or more women to make more soldiers. But it's never to prolong your life. It's never to put you on the earth you know, continually as God designed. It's none of that. It's it's only to benefit the cult or religion in some way. All right, well, comments, questions? I want to make these short. I, 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 as I said a long time ago, I want to try to get them down to a half an hour. I don't know if we went over that already, but it feels like it's only been ten minutes. Oh no! Well, we just did two hours. <laughs> Has it only been ten minutes? Oh no, it's been thirty minutes. <laughs> it's just that what I'm saying is so interesting. Yeah. <laughs> It felt like 10 minutes. I have a question. Yeah. Um, so I've heard some people label the criteria for a cult to be like, oh, if it's just, if we just follow the instructions of one man and that, like, no one can, uh, right. no one can uh, pay for themselves. Right. Um, so. That's a, that's a, that's a, an enlightenment view, uh, yeah. the, the post enlightenment view of the, of a cult. That's why I'm saying is that if you really want to know the distinctions, that, that God's distinctions of what a cult is, I would go here. Because you're going to get a lot of those things. And, and you look at those lists, and it's like, that's like talking about Christianity as well. Like, they're trying to include Christianity in their definition of a cult. And it's like, well, well, well uh, in, in, in a cult, you can't just uh, dress any way you want. And it's like... Well, yeah, God doesn't – does God want you to run around naked? I mean, no. I mean, so, um, well, in a cult, you can't just, you know, come up with your own ideas. And it's like, well, yeah, because you want to follow God. So so that's not really – that's a humanistic it's, – it's really just taking secular humanism and being like, anything that's not secular humanistic is a cult. Yeah. And it's like – I think what we're seeing today is that that's not true. Actually, secular humanism is very much a cult, and it's one of the worst ones. Um and this is how we should look at cults. Like, what? The, who, who is the leader? Is the leader one who actually comes and speaks the words from God and it gives his life up for the people? 
uh, or is he taking life from them? I think that, that right there, again, it makes a distinction between the Lord Jesus and everybody else. So, something I learned when I was young, I, I had a bunch of Mormon friends that I'd go and hang out at their house all the time. And one day I brought this uh, book about Jehovah's Witnesses, and I was reading it. And uh, they had a lot of daughters, so they had other Mormon missionaries coming in and dating them or whatever. And this Mormon missionary comes in, and thinking that I was a Mormon, because I was there, um, and I'm reading this Jehovah's Witness book, and he starts laughing. And it's like, oh, yeah, they're a cult. And um, I was like, yeah, I agree. And then we started talking about it and explaining to him that Mormonism is a cult. But that's what you're going to get with cults. They're all going to call each other a cult. Someone can look at us and be like, oh, you're just calling other people a cult, but you're the same thing. And that's why I think we need the objective criteria of Scripture to look at and be like, well, no, according to Scripture, we're not a cult. Because um, this, is, this is completely the opposite of what cults do. We're not taking life from people. We're looking to give it to them. Because that's what the Lord is doing. That's what we were talking so, about earlier, was that there, the, the world or the secular world thinks that all religions are exactly the same. They just don't know there's any distinction. If you call your religion th this or that, they, they think we're all the same. So that's how they view us. So when they call you a cult or me a cult or somebody a cult, they don't understand what that means exactly. They just think because you worship God and you... You make your women submissive, or you have a lot of children, or they don't understand the exact reasoning. Well, the power in the devil's religions and cults is really in the workspace salvation. Because if you have to work for your salvation, now I hold something over you. Now you, I can actually take it away from you. Like, you, you are working for it, and therefore you're always trying to please. Only in Christianity does God actually say, you don't have to work for it. The, the son actually ac acquired it for you. Here it is as a, as a free gift. There's no working for it. Here it is. You take it. That's totally different uh, than a cult. It's like, no, you work for it, and now I, I'm going to need your money, or you're not going to, uh, I'm going to need your wife because you got to work. For, you, you, well, I'm going to need all, everything that you own and everything that you are. No. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, anything else? I, I guess I just want you guys to see, and I know all of you probably already see this, but I want you to see that it's not just a matter of my dad's better than your dad, and therefore you're a cult, but I'm not. I'm really trying to get you to see that Christianity really is the different, it, that all religions are the same, except for Christianity. It really is Christianity versus everything else. And so I want you to see that, look, it's superior because it actually gives life as opposed to the rest that actually just kind of say that, well, maybe you'll get life if you give me all your stuff and work for it. And maybe you won't. All right. Well, let's uh, go ahead and end there. And uh, Emmanuel, you want to pray for us? Dear Lord, Heavenly Father. Lord, we're so grateful for this evening, Lord, to be to be here together to hear your word. Lord, thank you for the free gift, Lord, that you've given to us. Something that we don't have to work for, and we also can even if we try. Lord, continue to sanctify us, Lord, continue to strengthen us, and continue to pray for all the needs of your people, Lord. And we thank you for sending us the Holy Spirit to work in us, Lord, and to, con to continue to conform us to your Lord Christ, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.